Welcome to another edition, First Star Logistics in the Trenches with Dave Lapham, our podcast. And uh, we're pleased to be joined by none other than the great Solomon Wilcots this morning and great player, broadcaster, multi-talented individual. Solly, how you doing, my man? Dave, I'm doing great. Thank you for that uh, fine introduction. Um, I don't know if I'm worthy of it, but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> You're definitely worthy of it, my man. Definitely worthy of it. So this is going to be a little bit of uh, initially here, a little, this is your life, Solomon Wilcox. We're going to take you back to high school days, Riverside, California, a great football player, obviously. Did you play all the sports, Solly, growing up? Were you a multi-sport guy? Yeah, you know, mostly basketball, right? And mm -hmm. uh, played, um, I didn't get to play baseball um, in the more formal way. We all played in the community and the neighborhood. We had these epic baseball games. <laughs> and I loved doing that. But I tell you, I played basketball so much. We played all year round. I played in summer leagues and AAU that when baseball came around, it was hard for me to give up the hoop dream. Yeah. So I really played mostly uh, basketball and football. Um, but then, um, you know, I played baseball just around the neighborhood against other, uh, other uh, streets. We used to play one street versus another. Yeah, where I grew up, everyone played sports, every single household. Right, right. I could see you being a nose-to-belly-button tough defensive player. I mean, did you D everybody up pretty well in basketball? That, you know, uh, that's a pretty good observation. That's that's how I end up playing football and end up from day one wanting to play defensive back because um, defensively in basketball, that was maybe my best skill. I wish I could say I was a great three-point shooter and all those other right. things, but I can't, I can't attest to that. But defensively, that's what got me on every other every team that I made. It was really my ability to play great defense. I could steal the ball. I could stay in front of really great offensive players, and I had a real good vertical jump, so I could, I could block shots, I could rebound, I could, I could do a lot of different things. And uh, but that, it was really basketball that drew me to sports, and then from there everything else just kind of blossomed. So you have a great uh, football career in high school, and you, and you get recruited to go to University of Colorado under Bill McCartney, who. I, I had the privilege of doing Big 12 games. You did too as well, um, covering some Big 12 action. And, and Bill McCartney was a, just a great person, man. I really enjoyed getting to know him a little bit. And he was your head coach. You uh, redshirt, medical redshirt your freshman year, and it's a 1-10 in 10 season. But then you were part of the big turnaround. I mean, from that point forward, go to three bowl games. What was it like to be part of that turnaround at Colorado? Oh, it was phenomenal you know I had left the high school program we won a lot of games that played for a great coach in high school and I got to Colorado and and I saw this apathy and I saw the losing you know I knew we were at a great school with a great campus and a great environment Boulder is one of the most beautiful places you could ever go right. to go to school and I was like there's no way we should be losing, you know, school and campus as beautiful as this right. and all the opportunities. I, and I remember telling Coach Mack, you know, my freshman year, I said, Coach, if you let me recruit some of the guys out of my neighborhood uh, <laughs> where I grew up in Los Angeles and, and Riverside, California, I said, I'm telling you, we'll beat Oklahoma, we'll beat Nebraska. And I said, these guys aren't scared. And, I, and he challenged me on that. I remember when it came time to host certain players, you know, guys like Darian Hagan, guys like Eric Bieniemy, a lot of the guys that came out of, you know, Dion figures. And even uh, we didn't get Jamel Holloway. He ended up going to Oklahoma. They ended up winning a national championship. But you remember Jamel Holloway. Sure, yeah. Um, Troy Hickman had to transfer from Oklahoma to UCLA because they signed Jamel Holloway. Well, that's the one that got away. Lap. I mean, if we would have got him, I think we would have won – a national championship sooner. Um, but yeah, it was, that sort of began the development of the program that eventually ended up winning a championship in 1990. Now I had already left and was playing in the NFL, but I like to think that the seeds for that national championship team were planted with me having that conversation with coach Mack, like, Hey, we got to <laughs> get more kids out of LA. So we did it. And uh, we still, he and I still talk about that today. Is that right? Yeah, he's. I'll tell you what. Oh yeah. That that uh, that guy. He just 
there was something about him. I, I, I really don't know. I can't really put it into words, but do you know, some people just have the it factor or whatever. Yeah. Surrounded. He kind of had it, whatever it is. You know, it's hard to define it, I guess. I can define it. Uh, okay. And I didn't know. I knew he had it when we, when I played for him. But it, later after I came to Cincinnati, it was after my rookie year. You may remember this. It was a strike year. Yeah. So as an eighth round pick, I make the team, and next thing you know, I'm out of a job because we're striking. And I, you know, as a rookie, I didn't have any say so in that. But all I know is I'm out of a job, and so I went about trying to get a real job. I didn't trust this NFL thing, and so I ended up um, enrolling in this management training program with Midland, with the Midland Company through their insurance division, and Joe Hayden. Mm-hmm was the CEO of the company. Turns out his college roommate was Bo Schimbeckler at Miami of Ohio, right. the head coach at Michigan. Right. And Bill McCartney had coached at Michigan for eight years as the defensive coordinator under Bo. Huh. So after I got to meet Joe Hayden, after I got to meet Bo, who was on our board, I said, that's it. The Bo Schimbeckler that everybody knows about, the Woody Hayes that everybody knows about, because Bo played for Woody yep. at Miami of Ohio, at coach under Woody at Ohio State before he became the great coach at Michigan. Coach Mack, his mannerisms, his his ability to give a great speech and fire a team up, I mean, it was so identical to Bo Schimbeckler. that Bo would tell me all these stories about Coach Mack, and it, I, it gave me a greater appreciation for Coach Mack as a leader of men hmm. because Bo was that in spades, right? Right. And, and the way that they taught me about business and, and Bo Schimbeckler, I worked with a lot of guys from Michigan over at Midland. They had all once played for Bo, and then they leave Michigan to come to work here in Cincinnati. So I found myself plunged into this environment, to this culture, of Michigan men, right, who had played for Bo. But it was the same things I had been taught during my years at Colorado playing under Coach Matt. Right. And so I fit right in with these guys, and they recognized it in me. I recognized it in them. And it was really transformational in terms of what has occurred in my life and the things that I learned. And so I owe a lot to Coach Mack. And I got to know Bo Schimbeckler in a, in a personal, close personal way due to my relationship and having played for Coach Mack in Boulder. Now, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you get drafted in the NFL in 1987. In 1988, your second year, you go to the Super Bowl, and you're playing in the Super Bowl. What was that experience like? Well, yeah, it was, I had to pinch myself, right? Yeah, you go right. from a from an eighth-round pick um, to making the team, then there is no team. You got scab guys playing in your uniform and, <laughs> right, right. and you're out of a job, you know, and the next thing you know, when we do come back, we couldn't win a game that rookie year. You remember you covered us and we were four and 11. And yep. We come into the 88 season. I remember Paul Brown, he stood in front of the team. He said, you guys don't know how good you really are. He said, have these teams come in to play you. They don't know what team's going to show up the good team or the bad team. And then we just kind of figured it out. Yeah, we looked around the room and said, you know, we are pretty good. We need, right. to, we need to start performing like it, right? And you know what those early games were like in 88. They were nail biters against some really good teams like the Eagles with, you know, Reggie White and Jerome Brown and Randall Cunningham and Chris Carter and Keith Jackson. I mean, those were battles, right? We oh, had to yeah. beat some really good teams. But once we did it, we really proved to ourselves what we thought we knew is that we are a good team. And, and that momentum kind of carried over. And then we got into the postseason. I just felt like the young guys really needed to step up. I remember Eric Thomas and I saying, look, these, these guys are proven. They know they're good, but they, they expect us to hold our weight. And that's when I remember our secondary just kind of became the real driving force for our defense. We had Tim Crumry, who was the anchor. Yeah. There's no doubt. But I felt like our secondary was going to be the part that put us over the top and that Dick LeBeau taught us that if we don't screw it up, we can win every game. And, and we didn't until the, until the Super Bowl in those final few seconds. If, if we would have held up, I still believe we would have won that Super Bowl game against the 49ers. It was – 
it was on us on the back end. We let Rice get one on second and 29, and then we let John Taylor get one. Those two plays, if we do our jobs, the Cincinnati Bengals, they would have a Vince Lombardi trophy in the building. You're talking about that that famous secondary, the SWAT team. I mean, the, the, the guys you had back there in that secondary, you mentioned E.T. Take us through the personalities and the skill set of those guys on the back end of that 88 Super Bowl team. Yeah, I think it all started with David Fulcher because, you know, Full Rock was, he, you know, what people have seen like in a Troy Palomalu and a Ed Reed, uh, but David was bigger, you know, right. and he was, he was such a, like he had these instincts that would allow him to make these big splash plays, these phenomenal plays out of nowhere that every team needs that kind of player. You know, J.J. Watt is that kind of player. If you look at what J.J. Watt did, your know, full rock was that kind of player. Right. He had these instincts and this uncanny knack of making the big play when we need it. Mm-hmm. And whether it was rushing the quarterback, whether it was in pass coverage, whether it was a run stuffer, whether it was a hitter over the middle of the field against receivers, he just, I mean, he had a knack of finding the ball and making the big play. And um, Eric Thomas was our true shutdown corner. He was as good, I think, as any corner that the Bengals have ever had when he was on top of his game. It was a Pro Bowl year for him in 88. It was just his second year in the league. And we were going up against the run and shoot of Warren Moon, Ernest Givens, you know, um, Bernie Kozar and and Webster Slaughter in Cleveland, um, you know, Lewis Lips in in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And Eric always took the top guy. You know, he took Mike Quick when we played the Eagles. He took whomever we play, Jerry Rice. He took the best receiver uh, on the other, uh, on, you know, uh, uh, for the other team. And then Lewis Billups had a knack of making a lot of plays. You know, Lewis was just the kind of guy that he was as good as any number one corner on any team. I think Eric just had that speed and quickness that allowed him to maybe play a little bit better and the ball fell right for, for Eric where he had all those interceptions. But Lewis Billups was just a consistently good player out of a small HBCU at Alabama State that, you know, everybody looked at our two corners and said, these guys are great. And then, you know, Ricky Dixon had been a rookie in 88, had been a first top five pick out of, um, out of uh, Oklahoma. Yeah. And, I mean, he was incredible. And so he had been an all-American safety when we were playing in my corner. So in terms of being having our third, you know, three top-notch corners, and I, I'm saying I'd be remiss if I didn't name Barney Bussey because I just felt that Barney was probably our best all-around defensive back. If you, the guy could play linebacker, the guy could play strong safety, the guy could play free safety, and he could do anything. I mean, if you. You needed to play at, at defensive end. He might be able to do that. <laughs> he he was he was a freak of nature guy. He was strong for his body type. He was a strong player. He was tough. He was a great tackler. He had played in the USFL, so he had more experience than a lot of us. And we all looked up to him. I know Eric Thomas and I. We we still look up to Barney Bussey because. We used to say that he had the strength of 10 men. <laughs> and uh, I still think as we knock on 60, he, he still is the same way, still in great shape to this day. But that, that was our secondary. I think our greatest strength is that we played together. We didn't care who got the credit. We just played together. It was all about winning. And uh, that was very important to us because that's what Dick LeBeau taught us. Yeah, and, and coached by Dick LeBeau, one of the one of the greatest ever, and you know, player, coach, you name it. I mean, Dick LeBeau just he had he had uh, uh, just an unbelievable, uncanny ability to be respected, liked. I mean, the the guy was just a, a dream come true as a coach. There's no question about it. He was he was something special. Do you think Stanley Wilson's issue, you know, before the Super Bowl, Tim Crumry get having his leg, you know, broken in multiple places, both bones in his leg, you know, during the Super Bowl. Do you think if Either of those things did not occur. Uh, it might have been a different outcome. Do you think those things were that big of a factor? You know, I think those things played a role in us. You know, I, I think if you go back and look at it, I think we played a great game. No doubt. on defense. You no know, doubt. The 49ers were a juggernaut of an offense. And, 
they played in two Super Bowls after that 88. They came back the next year, beat Denver, scored 50 points. Yep. Then they played another Super Bowl against the Chargers a few years later, scored 50-plus points. <laughs> so, so, you know, we held them to 20, and they only had, I think, 13 up until the last 40 seconds to go. But, yeah, you know, not having – Stanley was a tough physical dude now. Yeah. And the guy gave our offense this physicality and this mentality that we didn't have in 87. He brought that to the table in 88. And remember, I told you, I grew up in Los Angeles, and I remember Stanley went to one of the most prestigious uh, high schools with a football program. Um, Vince Ferragamo's brother uh, taught there, and that was the Banning High School in Carson, California, right next to Compton, where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And Stanley was the L.A. Player of the Year. Hmm. And, and, And now you're talking some great players out of Los Angeles. He was the City Player of the Year and became one of the first freshman running back to ever start as a freshman at Oklahoma under Barry Switzer. Pretty strong. So you're talking, a, he was a great player. And and I knew that. So when he came in 88, yeah, I was happy to have him back after he had served his suspension time. And I, I grew close to him because I, I knew when this guy stepped across those white lines, he was going to bring it. Yeah. And teams respected him. And they, I mean, I almost feared him, right? So now he's not able to play, and uh, it, so we were missing something. Because I can tell you right now, I'm not saying he was Ronnie Lott, but we needed somebody to match Ronnie's intensity. Yeah. And, you know, Ronnie was a mentor of mine. When I went to high school, he went to high school in the Inland Empire. He was much older than me, and he had played with Anthony Munoz at, at USC. And so I, you know, I knew Ronnie. I'd gotten to know him, and I remember talking to Ronnie before the game. He wouldn't even talk to me. I'm like, this is the guy that, you know, I worked in camps as a counselor. <laughs> and he came to speak to kids. He right. was, oh, he'd take me to lunch. Now he don't even know me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so he was intense now. He was intense. We needed Stanley, and certainly we needed Crum Ryan. Crum Ryan was the heart and soul of our defense. And I admired him from the very first day. Now, I remember we had a practice. And uh, that night we were watching the, the the film of our practice, and I'm in the I'm a rookie, and I'm in the back of the room, and I I nudge ET, uh, Eric, I said, look at number sixty nine, look at that dude, <laughs> this this dude, that's how you practice. I said, see how that dude? I said, that's how we got to practice, man. I said that that dude loves playing some football. Right on. And I just remember sixty nine, uh, and I've always admired him. I mean, I, every game. Every practice was the same. He had no off switch. He had no kill switch. The dude was bloody in the huddle, and the other guy playing across from him was bloody too. No doubt. And Eric and I would be like, look at this. <laughs> we, we, we still talk about Tim Crowline. When all of us get together, Timmy may not even be there, but – one of us going to tell a Tim Crumry story. So, <laughs> so yeah, we, we, we miss those two guys. But, you know, we gave it our best. And, uh, you know, I always tell myself, man, I think our best was, was good enough. We just didn't have our best on the field that day. Right, right. That's a good way to put it, a solid way to put it. So you, you finished a distinguished uh, playing career, you know, Bengals, Vikings, Pittsburgh Steelers. Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, family-owned operations. Similarities, differences, more more similarities than differences. Sully, what's your take on that? Dave Lapham here, and every day I am grateful for my experience to have played professional football. As a player, I realize self-motivation, leadership, and appreciating your teammates are key. At First Star Logistics, you can use those same attributes to create the life you want for you and your family. Build your future by working hard like I did. You'll see results both on and off the field. Call First Star Logistics today and be part of our winning team. Opportunity knocking. You know, this one's close because I, you know, I, I love Mike and uh, the Bengals and the Brown family. They drafted me into this league. Right. And I respect what they do. And I remember... I remember when I went to the Vikings, um, you may know Paul Wiggins. You know that name, yes, right? Yes, sir. Yep. Paul, Paul Wiggins is a great coach in this league. He was a great player, mm-hmm. and he played on those championship teams under Paul Brown. Right. But the Cleveland Browns, he blocked for Jim Brown. Yep. And he he was a coach 
in Minnesota when I got there. He later became a personnel guy. And, and I remember 91 was my first year there, and that was the year PB passed away. And I didn't know Paul Wiggins at the time. He came over and asked me my thoughts on Paul Brown. I was like, are you kidding me? This guy's the father of football. And he, I said he was, he was a great man. He was still a great coach up until the end. I remember him helping me on a few things. And I said, I owe him a lot because he didn't have to draft me, and he did. And then Paul began to tell me how he had played for him. And I, I was like, oh. And so he said, you know, every year – when we go to the Senior Bowl, we go on scouting junkets and looking at players at the pro days. Yeah, we follow the Brown family. Hmm. Players they're looking at or the players we look at because they know talent. Mm -hmm. and, and that was so true when Paul was alive. And you, you know, Paul, how he activated so many high school coaches at the high school level, not just in the state of Ohio, but around the country. Sure. And he had guys looking at talent and scouting talent for him all across, from sea to shining sea, all, all right. the way to San Diego, California, where where Sid Gilman <laughs> lived, and mm -hmm. all the way, you know, he, that's how he found you, Dave. I mean, he had guys everywhere. And so I, I learned that. And, and so the Pittsburgh Steelers are the same way. You know, they went into those HBCU schools and got Joe Green and got um, John Starworth and got Donnie Shale. Much in the same way the Bengals got Coy Bacon yeah. and uh, Lamar Parrish and Isaac Curtis, or excuse me, um, um, uh, Kenny Riley and Lewis Breeden, right? Sure. So those were the similarities. I, you know, they were very strong, and it's what allowed the Bengals to get off to such a fast start as an expansion team. People don't realize how fast and how rapidly they became successful after being an expansion team without free agency. So – those are similarities. I think some of the differences is I would love to see Bengals top brass become closer with players mm -hmm. while they're playing mm -hmm. because the, the, the Rooney family is not afraid. They're unafraid to be very close with their players while they're playing. I do know Mike has a special affinity for his players. Uh, I do know that he does more for people than people would ever know. No doubt. Um, and I do know that after they're done playing, that's when players find out, like, man, I didn't know he was such a great guy. I didn't know he was such a great owner. I wish I, wish I had known this Mike Brown when I played for him. Yeah. And, and I tell Mike, I said, Mike, you got to let these guys know. And there's something about, the way he does business, that he really does care. You know, you and I both know that. But yeah. I think some people, they govern with their heart, some govern with their head. And I think for, I think for him, it's difficult to uh, – and when you've got to cut a player and you've got to make this, these tough decisions, you can't, there are some people who like, i got to leave the heart out of the room because it's, it's just a business decision. And I get that. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you this, the Rooney family, that's where they're a little bit different. Maybe they'll make a mistake on a player by keeping them too long because the hardest part of the the equation, and maybe they have might make a mistake, but they're going to err on the side of this human quality of investing in their players at a fault. Mm -hmm. And when I would come back in after a game, and every still to this day, Mr. Rooney would be right there by the door every after every game saying, thank you for playing hard for me today. Really, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, Jerome Bettis tells me, Solomon, I wouldn't still be here if that man, Mr. Rooney, wouldn't tell Coach Cowher, Jerome Bettis is coming back for a final season. And guess what? They end up winning the Super Bowl that year. Right. You see? Right. So there are some differences there, and but it's not much. It's not much. Um, but I will say that it's, it's enough to make a big difference when it comes to players who play hard for their owners every single week and no one can tell me that the Steelers their players lay it on the line for that ownership group every Sunday they could have a good record bad record but they lay it on the line <laughs> and that and uh, I've seen that over the years and I remember Dick LeBeau used to tell us about the Steelers that well before I ever played there he used to say no matter how good or bad this team is they're going to play hard yep. and he was right yep they they do they give they empty the effort bucket, man, every single snap, you know. They get after That's you. That's right. They get after you. So you get you get finished playing playing football, and you graduate with an English uh, literature degree at Colorado. Obviously, everybody can 
see how well-spoken you are and the command you have of the language and ability to communicate. You start your TV career uh, here in, with the Cincinnati affiliate, WLWT, and I respect the heck out of you, Solly, because you, you, you wanted to learn every aspect of the broadcast world. What, what made a show happen? You know, behind the scenes, in front of the camera, behind the camera, paid your dues, man. And, uh, and then you ended up getting, uh, you win an Emmy as a sideline reporter on ESPN Sunday Night Football, and off you go, CBS analyst, and everything you've done with radio and television, still doing serious NFL radio, uh, NFL network stuff, total access show. I, I, I loved it when you guys did Playbook. You know, you and uh, Sterling and, and uh, Baldy and Mayock. It, 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 it's just good stuff, you know. And it, When did you decide that you wanted to get into the broadcast world? And your work ethic in football, did that carry over to the broadcast world? Is that what made you as successful as you are? Yeah, I think, you know, it was, it was a combination of, you know, I knew I wanted to do it, but then that strike year, I tell you, it left such a huge impression on me because then it, it I never really trusted the work environment. I, you could be fired at any minute. You could be right. just told to pack it up. So I always – felt like I needed to broaden my skills. I need to have more than one source of employment. I mean, it really just kind of, you know, got me going a different direction. But more than anything, it made me to understand I needed to really enhance my, my business acumen. And so while I had studied English literature and broadcasting at Colorado, I wanted to go work on the corporate side and learn business skills, learn how to grow business and, mm-hmm. and learn and just enhance other skills. And so while I was there, one of my mentors, you know, I remember he told me, he said, why are you here? You know you want to work in television. He said, you can always come back, but you ought to give that a shot. If you don't, you're going to kick yourself for the rest of your days. And, you know, and, and so when Bill Hayden told me that, I, he was right. So um, I went over and started talking with some of the local affiliates here, and I couldn't get a job. I didn't have any requisite skills that allowed them to do that, but they, they would – bring me in as an unpaid intern, meaning I get to work for free, right? You yeah, know? right. So, right. So, but George Vogel was so wonderful to me and the people at Channel 5, Scott Simpson and and uh, Ron Millinor and Kent Weaver and that group. Yeah. Uh, there were some good people. No doubt. Some smart, nice, talented guys. And you know, I learned how to edit from Scott. He taught me. I just would sit in the edit bay for hours on end watching him edit learn how to, and then my skill, I knew how to write. And what I learned in my management training program is how to help a business become profitable. That the only way I was going to get on the air is I had to be able to take what I was producing, be able to sell it and get sponsors. And if the station was making money, then they would gladly put me on the air, but they weren't going to do me any favors. (laughs) So I figured out how to do that. And then they put me on the air and found out how bad I was and said, well, you need some more work. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I had to continue to work at it. I mean, I had to really work on presentation and, and all of those things. But the writing came natural. And so it just took a while. You know it's an art form, Dave. You know that. It's, sure. it's not like any other vocation. It's an art form. You've got to really harness a lot of different moving parts to create this this presentation that people want to buy into. They were either learning or they're laughing. They want to be entertained or they want to be educated. Mm-hmm. And if you can do both, then you're really cooking. And it took me a while to, to pull it all together. But when it clicked, um, it did. And it was because I had a lot of help from a lot of different people at that station and was able to develop a great foundation before going on to ESPN and then CBS and NFL Network. Well, you've had a heck of a career, Solly. There's no doubt. Let's let's go to the current day uh, Cincinnati Bengals. Joe Burrow, you you do some work with Pro Football Focus and Chris Collinsworth, and uh, Joe Burrow was part of the 2020 draft, which Pro Football Focus rated the Bengals number one in the league with that draft in, in 2020, and with the first pick in every round, the first pick of the draft, you hope that you execute and and find some uh, find some nuggets that you can develop. And what do you think of Joe Burrow being one of those? Well, first of all, he came to us as a tremendously polished player. 
especially at the quarterback position. Yeah. From the neck up, he's phenomenal. He can handle protection. He can handle um, diagnosing blitzes. And I mean, at the speed of the game, he had played at LSU in a pro style system under Joe Brady. That really, um, you rarely get a quarterback who's got all that going for himself when they come into this league. Now, still going to be a learning curve because we play at a faster speed with a little bit more complexity. But he came in as polished in those areas as much as any quarterback in the last 20 years. And then from a leadership standpoint, he was off the chart. You know, able to walk into a locker room and from day one, command respect. You and I both know that's rare. Yeah. But it's because he was a fifth-year guy. He had kind of, you know, he's, he's a little bit older than a quarterback who was in college for three years and then came into our league. He'd been, you know, and he's, he's, he's the son of a coach. And he's from this area. So he, I think he knew the area. He knew the team. He kind of knew the history of the organization and his dad being a coach, having played at Ohio State and played at LSU in some big games against big teams on that big stage. He was as about as ready as anyone. Now, yeah, I'll share this with you because our PFF uh, metric shows that, you know, if you're driving 100 miles an hour all the time and you don't calibrate that speed a little bit, right. you're probably going to crash. Right. You're probably going to crash. Right? It's going to be bad. So I, was really con- I was really concerned when I saw him throwing – 40 times a game. I mean, he threw the ball more in a game than any rookie in the 101-year history of our league. Yep. 10 games he played in, 41. he averaged 41 pass attempts per game, 10 straight games. Yes. No preseason, no training camp. I'm like, we need to hit the brake. We need to slow this car down a little bit with, you know, Playing behind that offensive line, and I tell you, man, going into Washington, I lamented. I, I said, I don't like this matchup for us. Yeah. Not good. I want us to run the ball today and get the hell out of here. That's what, I mean, we, hey, look, we were saying that when Tom Brady went there in the playoffs. Am I right? Uh, four number one we picks, you know. Picks. Every every guy up That's front's right. a number one pick, man. <laughs> That's right. I'm like, we need to just get out of here. I'm afraid for Joe today. And, man, my worst fears came true. Mm-hmm. And so, I, listen, if you go back to week one, they, Carson Wentz had this horrible season because of what that Washington team did to him week one. Yep. Eight sacks that day on him. Right. And he was never the same. And I'm like, we got to be more. And so, I, I, I don't know what we talked that up to. I just It was negligent is what it was. I'm just be honest. Okay? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. You cannot expose a player of this caliber you know, you got to play the long game with with a guy like Joe Brady. You, what are we doing? We, what are we What are we racing to? What are we trying to? A hundred miles an hour for what? This is a, it's the long game with him. Protect him, and he'll take care of this franchise. I think this franchise got bright futures as long as he's healthy and ready to go. So we now need to hit the reset button and need to better think about how we manage getting him to the at elite level in the, uh, you know, in the NFL, but it starts with protection. So all the resources moving forward need to be dedicated to protecting him and helping him to be the best that he can be, because if he's the best that he can be, he'll make this organization the best that it can be. Couldn't agree more. And uh, so are you, are you in the camp for 21 draft with the fifth pick of the draft? Bengals to take Sewell if he's available or or an offensive lineman that they have rated as the best offensive lineman on the board at that point? Yeah, it'll either be Sewell or the kid from Northwestern, but right. one of them will be one of them will be there. Right? You better get ready to take them. And I, I agree with bringing back Coach Pollard as the offensive line coach because he can develop them and get them ready. He did that in Dallas. The guy's a great offensive line coach. I think we missed it. I think we should have went after um, Coach Callahan last year when he left the Washington football team. We let we let the Browns get him, and you see what he did to their offensive line, right? Oh, yeah. So, so we missed on that. I thought we should have made that move aggressively because I think it would have been better because we certainly would have been able to run the ball because if you run it, you're going to protect the quarterback. And uh, – 
So now we brought in Coach Pollard. I think that's a great hire. And I think we ought to pour our assets into creating a much better offensive line, much better running game, play action, RPO stuff. That's going to keep the quarterback upright. And he's going he's to get fewer hits. And this guy will win for – he had us in every single game just about when he started last year. And uh, he'll, do, he'll do the same. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm all in for creating a better offensive line, better running game for Joe Burrow. Yeah, Rashawn Slater out of Northwestern, Penny Sewell, yeah. uh, Oregon, uh, and then under the tutelage of Frank Pollock. I mean, I think I think that uh, that that the sky could be the limit. Not, and, and I agree. You know, I, I'm old school in that, I, and I understand Joe Burrow. You know, well, you got a great, maybe a generational tight end. You know, available. Pitts is uh, is an extraordinary player. You know, I mean, he makes you do things defensively that normally you wouldn't have to do to defend this type of player. I understand all those kind of things, but man, if you don't have time, it doesn't matter who the hell you have out there as skilled players. You know, it really doesn't. I mean, it's it's got to start up front. Look at the. Uh, in, in my opinion, the, the Bengals' offensive line was best in franchise history when they had the Mexican connection. Munoz at left tackle and Montoya at right guard. So, That's you know, right. so sign a, if you sign a guard in free agency, for example, draft that tackle, you know, and, and yep. fi- find yourself real good at two of the five spots, you know, and then, and then you, can, you can start to deal a little bit. And Joe Burrow's life becomes a hell of a lot easier and everything that goes along with it, there's – there's no question about that. Real quick, Solly, finally, uh, final thought yeah. uh, question for you. AFC North, with Ben Roethlisberger, the Steelers kind of in transition a little bit. Looks like Ben will be there for another year, but the Steelers are transitioning a little bit at quarterback. you got young quarterbacks. you got Heisman Trophy winners at every other team in the AFC North. Every other starting quarterback in the AFC North uh, won a Heisman in college. So what do you see – out of the AFC North, when can the Bengals be more competitive in the AFC North? I think once I think if we could rebuild this offensive line with our backfield with Samaje, P. Ryan, and obviously Giovanni Bernard and Mixon, yep. those three guys are phenomenal backs. I, I, I mean, I'm I like all three of them to be honest with you. And I love the diversity of skill set, so that's why I believe we're good there. Mm-hmm. You know, you get this offensive line where we could be physical and then obviously pour more assets into the defensive line. We, I know injuries occurred last year, but all you have to do is go look at that game against Pittsburgh um, on Monday night. If that, that tells you all you need to know. Yep. Can you, can you beat them yet? Will you show up with the mentality and the heart that's required to beat them? That's the only thing in question. Because you saw that night. The Cincinnati Bengals, that that game made me so very proud because I said, if you are going to play with, against Pittsburgh or Baltimore, that's how you got to show up. You cannot be apologetic. You cannot flinch when you play them because they smell fear now, I'm telling you. No I question. played with them. No question. <laughs> I played with them. <laughs> yes, sir. I, I, know how they, I know how they size people up. Yes, sir. And – and uh, you better take the field with a swagger that is unquestionable. And that's the only thing they respect. They don't respect anything else. You can't bob and weave and ease your way into any time you play it against Pittsburgh or Baltimore. You better come out fighting. And that night, they did. They came out putting it to them. Big hits by Von Miller that we ain't seen in this secondary Yeah, in Von years. Bell. Yeah. You know? Von Bell's hit on I'm Juju Smith Houston. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You know, so um and so when you when you play that way, you're dictating terms, you're dictating tempo, and that's how you play in the AFC North. Anyone who's ever played in this division know that's how you play. And if you ain't gonna play that way, don't expect to win. So they've already shown that they can do it. I think the conversation this offseason as they go into the season has to build upon that kind of performance and on that kind of game. And I think Coach has to continue to hold that out in front of them for the kind of intensity they've got to play with every single week to even have a shot at winning in this division. The mind has to be right when you when you line up in that football game. You're absolutely right, That's Sally. Right. 
So Ali, I'll tell you what, you're a, you're a guy that, uh, that I have a ton of respect for. Uh, the way you played the game, the way you broadcast the football game, uh, your work ethic. I, I'll tell you, you're a, you're a credit to, uh, to everybody, a credit to any organization you've been with, a credit to your family. And uh, it was a pleasure catching up with you on this uh, podcast, my man. I really appreciate it. Well, Dave, thank you. You know, you are like me. You had the pleasure of playing under Paul Brown and hearing Paul speak. I, I still um, remember him talking about how we were to use our football careers to determine yep. what we were going to do with the rest of our lives. He, he really made sure that we were aware of that. He pushed us on that all the time. And he, he held that in front of us. And all the players – Whoever played for him, that's what they talk about. And so the Don Shulas who played for Paul Brown, the uh, Chuck Knowles who played for Paul Brown, the John Wootens who played for Paul Brown, everywhere you go, anyone who played for Paul Brown, that's what they talk about. And I think that's what we all lived by, and that was the real true measure of the man. And, and as far as I'm concerned, it still is. I agree with you, Solly. I mean, he, he was the first guy that, that I listened to that – talked about, you know, use the NFL. It's a hell of a platform. Use it. It's the early stages of your work career, but there's so many more years afterwards, so use it to the best way you can possibly use it and, and don't, uh, don't, don't basically fumble the opportunity, you know. Go ahead and take it, right. full advantage of it, you know, and, and, and so many guys have. All the guys you talked about, and, you know, not to mention uh, Tommy Casanova in the medical profession, yeah. Bob, Bob Johnson in, right. the, in the business world, you know, Trumpy, Collinsworth, Wilcox, all these guys in the broadcast. It's, it's incredible. It's incredible. And, and Paul Brown, God rest his soul, if he were alive today, he'd be, he'd be proud of, of you and everybody else uh, that we talked about, Solly, for sure. Yeah, he, he started something now. No, <laughs> no doubt. doubt. Thanks, thanks for having me, Dave. I appreciate you. Thank you, Solly. Have a great one. Okay, all the best. Bye-bye. Appreciate you, man. Thanks, Solly.